Tonight, we are leaving the European Union. For many people, this is an astonishing moment of hope, a moment they thought would never come. And there are many, of course, who feel a sense of anxiety and loss. And then there's a third group, perhaps the biggest, who had started to worry that the whole political wrangle would never come to an end. I understand all those feelings. And our job as the government, my job, is to bring this country together now and take us forward. The most important thing to say tonight is that this is not an end, but a beginning. This is the moment when the dawn breaks and the curtain goes up on a new act in our great national drama. Which led to <laughs> Liz Truss. Yeah, that and is then Prime of Minister Boris Johnson announcing the United Kingdom's official exit from the European Union. Brexit was a contentious issue that was central to Johnson's win to become the UK's leader in 2019. Some in his own party objected to completely pulling out of the trade deal, which prompted Johnson to expel them. Our next guest was one of those 21 members of parliament who was ousted for voting against Johnson's Brexit deal. Now, all these years later, he's reflecting on how England's Conservative Party has changed and the similarities he's seeing here in the U.S. Joining us now, former member of the British Parliament and senior advisor of Give Directly, Rory Stewart. He's also the author of the new book entitled How Not to Be a Politician, a memoir. Um, I, I want to know the answer to that. Yeah, exactly. We want to know the answer to that, Mr. Stewart. But first, let's start by talking about what you grappled with, with a once conservative party that turned to hard right populist anti-immigrant, you say here, that displayed rampant cynicism, ignorance, glibness and sheer incompetence. What's the cure for all of that? I, I think the real cure is that the center or the more moderate people need to sort their act out. I think... I hate the populace deeply. I resigned from Parliament. I, I lost my seat because of it. But when I reflect on it, it's not just the fault of the populace like Boris Johnson. It's the fault of us. We were not communicating well enough. We weren't leading the country well enough. And we created the opportunity for the populace to come back. And this is true in the United States. It's true in Britain. It's true across Europe. It's, it's terrifying. And it's to do with many things from the economy to social media. But I think this is the big challenge of the next decade. Tell, tell me, why is it that mainstream Republicans, what uh, I used to call Main Street Republicans, independents and Democrats in the United States, as well as Tories and uh, some Tories and, and, and some, some member of, members of the Labor Party, why do we have such a hard time dealing with the firehood of falsehoods, whether they're coming from Boris Johnson's office or Donald Trump's office, Boris Johnson's campaign, Brexit's campaign, or Donald Trump's campaign. I mean, they're revealed to be lies by video. They're revealed to be lies as time passes. And yet uh, so many uh, people in Britain and the United States stay with these populists who have been caught in lie after lie after lie. I, I think part of the answer is that there's a little bit of truth hidden in those lies. And, and the truth is that the economic system let a lot of people down. The 2008 financial crisis revealed that there were big problems in our economies. I think our democracy wasn't performing for many people. I think Iraq and Afghanistan were humiliating messes. And of course, the populists exploit that kernel of truth. Their solutions are ridiculous. They're grotesque. They're often racist. They're divisive. But Part of the problem is that moderates like myself, yes, we need to stand up to the populace, but we also need a very clear, bold, emotionally compelling new message of where to take people in the future, rather than simply trying to defend the past. So uh, you can make a case, a pretty strong case, that Brexit altered both the political and financial landscape of Europe and the globe, actually. And it began, well, you'll bear this out and you, whatever you're gonna, your answer is going to be. David Cameron is prime minister, a sort of dashing, youngish figure, very glib, very articulate, and basically just threw it out there, voted up or down. We have confidence in you. Uh, did he do it out of indifference, ignorance? 
Why did he do it that way? I think he did it out of immense complacency. I mean, part, part of this book, How Not to Be a Politician, which is my 10 years' journey through all of this, is yes, it's about how bad the populists were, but it's also about how complacent the people that preceded them were. David Cameron basically grew up in the 90s, kind of Fukuyama, the end of history. He felt that everything had been sorted, everybody agreed with him. He thought there were a few fringe lunatics on the right, and he could resolve it. And how terribly wrong he proved because he destroyed his premiership. He had a terrible effect on the British economy, on security in Northern Ireland. He's weakened Britain immeasurably, and he provided the space for Boris Johnson and populism. So tell us a little bit more about the book, and congrats again on it, about the journey you have, you have taken, and, and what you see for yourself next at this particularly precarious moment for your country. Well, I, I think the book is partly about the journey of being a politician, and I, I feel when I talk to US senators and Congress people, People underestimate how modern politics is bad for your mind, your body, and your soul. How much time you spend simply fundraising, how much time you spend simplifying, how difficult it is to go from campaigning to governing seriously. For me, I'm now trying to find a way to build myself up again and re-enter politics, but it's very tough to do because the truth of the matter is whether you are moderate or whether you're on the extremes, the punishing impact on your family, your mental health, your life, and you end up with very, very strange people. And the people that we end up seeing on our television screens are not normal. People who can endure this are not normal. <laughs> That's for sure, and we witness it every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's that. an yeah. understatement for sure. So, Rory, you're in New York for the UN General Assembly, which is happening this week, and you say extreme poverty is the number one thing the UN should be working on. How does that play into all the other issues uh, that are, are uh, crises in the world right now, that are well, issues that should be addressed as well? It's terribly difficult. As you say, we've got to think about climate, we've got to think about AI, but right. the basic issue of extreme poverty, and I, I represent an organization that does unconditional cash transfers, give directly to the extreme poor, and what we're finding is the solutions are there, the hope is there for addressing extreme poverty. But the problem is immense, and aid budgets mm -hmm. are being cut all around the world, and sadly the focus is going away from the extreme poor. So I really hope the UN is going to focus again on the fundamental issue of poverty. The new book is entitled How Not to Be a Politician. Rory Stewart, thank you very much for coming on the show this morning. We appreciate it.